Pope Gregory I, Wikipedia Audio Pope Saint Gregory I, commonly known as Saint Gregory the Great, was Pope of the Catholic Church from September 3, 590. He is famous for instigating the first recorded large-scale mission from Rome, the Gregorian Mission, to convert a pagan people to Christianity. Gregory is also well known for his writings, which were more prolific than those of any of his predecessors as Pope. The epithet Saint Gregory the Dialogist has been attached to him in Eastern Christianity because of his dialogues. English translations of Eastern texts sometimes list him as Gregory Dialogus or the Latin equivalent Dialogus. A Roman senator's son and himself the prefect of Rome at 30, Gregory tried the monastery but soon returned to active public life, ending his life and the century as pope. Although he was the first pope from a monastic background, his prior political experiences may have helped him to be a talented administrator, who successfully established papal supremacy. During his papacy, he greatly surpassed with his administration the emperors in improving the welfare of the people of Rome, and he successfully challenged the theological views of Patriarch Eutychius of Constantinople before the Emperor Tiberius II. Gregory regained papal authority in Spain and France and sent missionaries to England. The realignment of barbarian allegiance to Rome from their Aryan Christian alliances shaped medieval Europe. Gregory saw Franks, Lombards, and Visigoths align with Rome in religion. Throughout the Middle Ages he was known as the father of Christian worship because of his exceptional efforts in revising the Roman worship of his day. His contributions to the development of the divine liturgy of the pre-sanctified gifts, still in use in the Byzantine Rite, were so significant that he is generally recognized as its de facto author. Early Life Gregory is a doctor of the Church and one of the Latin Fathers. He is considered a saint in the Catholic Church, Eastern Orthodox Church, Anglican Communion, and some Lutheran denominations. Immediately after his death, Gregory was canonized by popular acclaim. The Protestant reformer John Calvin admired Gregory and declared in his institutes that Gregory was the last good pope. He is the patron saint of musicians, singers, students, and teachers. Catholicism Portal Commentary on Job, frequently known in English language histories by its Latin title, Magna Moralia, or as Moralia on Job. This is one of the longest patristic works. It was possibly finished as early as 591. It is based on talks Gregory gave on the Book of Job to his brethren who accompanied him to Constantinople. The work as we have it is the result of Gregory's revision and completion of it soon after his accession to the papal office, Liber Reguli Pastoralis in which he contrasted the role of bishops as pastors of their flock with their position as nobles of the church, the definitive statement of the nature of the episcopal office. This was probably begun before his election as pope and finished in 591, Dialogues, a collection of four books of miracles, signs, wonders, and healings done by the holy men, mostly monastic, of 6th century Italy, with the second book entirely devoted to a popular life of Saint Benedict, sermons, including, the sermons include the 22 homily in High Ezekielum, dealing with Ezekiel 1.14.3 in Book 1, and Ezekiel 40 in Book 2. These were preached during 592-3, the years that the Lombards besieged Rome and contain some of Gregory's most profound mystical teachings. They were revised eight years later, the homily XL in Evangelia for the liturgical year, delivered during 591 and 592, 
which were seemingly finished by 593. A papyrus fragment from this codex survives in the British Museum, London, UK, Expositio Incantesis Canticorum. Only two of these sermons on the Song of Songs survive, discussing the text up to Song 1.9. The exact date of Gregory's birth is uncertain, but is usually estimated to be around the year 540, in the city of Rome. His parents named him Gregorius, which according to Alfred of Abingdon in an homily on the birthday of S. Gregory, is a Greek name, which signifies in the Latin tongue, vigilantius, that is in English, watchful. The medieval writer who provided this etymology did not hesitate to apply it to the life of Gregory. Alfred states, he was very diligent in God's commandments. Gregory was born into a wealthy patrician Roman family with close connections to the church. His father, Gordianus, who served as a senator and for a time was the prefect of the city of Rome, also held the position of regenarius in the church, though nothing further is known about that position. Gregory's mother, Silvia, was well born, and had a married sister, Pateria in Sicily. His mother and two paternal aunts are honored by Catholic and Orthodox churches as saints. Gregory's great-great-grandfather had been Pope Felix III, the nominee of the Gothic king, Theodoric. Gregory's election to the throne of St. Peter made his family the most distinguished clerical dynasty of the period. The family owned and resided in a villa suburbana on the Saelian Hill, fronting the same street as the former palaces of the Roman emperors on the Palatine Hill opposite. The north of the street runs into the Colosseum, the south, the Circus Maximus. In Gregory's day the ancient buildings were in ruins and were privately owned. Villas covered the area. Gregory's family also owned working estates in Sicily and around Rome. Gregory later had portraits done in fresco in their former home on the Saelian and these were described 300 years later by John the Deacon. Gordianus was tall with a long face and light eyes. He wore a beard. Sylvia was tall, had a round face, blue eyes and a cheerful look. They had another son whose name and fate are unknown. Gregory was born into a period of upheaval in Italy. From 542 the so-called Plague of Justinian swept through the provinces of the empire, including Italy. The plague caused famine, panic, and sometimes rioting. In some parts of the country, over one-third of the population was wiped out or destroyed with heavy spiritual and emotional effects on the people of the empire. Politically, although the Western Roman Empire had long since vanished in favor of the Gothic kings of Italy, during the 540s Italy was gradually retaken from the Goths by Justinian I, emperor of the Eastern Roman Empire ruling from Constantinople. As the fighting was mainly in the north, the young Gregory probably saw little of it. Totila sacked and vacated Rome in 546, destroying most of its population, but in 549 he invited those who were still alive to return to the empty and ruined streets. It has been hypothesized that young Gregory and his parents retired during that intermission to their Sicilian estates, to return in 549. The war was over in Rome by 552, and a subsequent invasion of the Franks was defeated in 554. After that, there was peace in Italy, and the appearance of restoration, except that the central government now resided in Constantinople. Like most young men of his position in Roman society, Saint Gregory was well educated, learning grammar, rhetoric, the sciences, literature, and law, and excelling in all. 
Gregory of Tours reported that in grammar, dialectic, and rhetoric, he was second to none. He wrote correct Latin but did not read or write Greek. He knew Latin authors, natural science, history, mathematics, and music and had such a fluency with imperial law that he may have trained in it as a preparation for a career in public life. Indeed, he became a government official, advancing quickly in rank to become, like his father, prefect of Rome, the highest civil office in the city, when only 33 years old. The monks of the monastery of St. Andrew, established by Gregory at the ancestral home on the Sahelian, had a portrait of him made after his death, which John the Deacon also saw in the 9th century. He reports the picture of a man who was rather bald and had a tawny beard like his father's and a face that was intermediate in shape between his mother's and father's. The hair that he had on the sides was long and carefully curled. His nose was thin and straight and slightly aquiline. His forehead was high. He had thick, subdivided lips and a chin of a comely prominence and beautiful hands. In the modern era, Gregory is often depicted as a man at the border, poised between the Roman and Germanic worlds, between East and West, and above all, perhaps, between the ancient and medieval epochs. Monastic Years On his father's death, Gregory converted his family villa into a monastery dedicated to the Apostle St. Andrew. In his life of contemplation, Gregory concluded that in that silence of the heart, while we keep watch within through contemplation, we are as if asleep to all things that are without. It seems to some that Gregory was not always forgiving, or pleasant for that matter, even in his monastic years. For example, a monk lying on his deathbed confessed to stealing three gold pieces. Gregory forced the monk to die friendless and alone, then threw his body and coins on a manure heap to rot with a curse, take your money with you to perdition. Gregory believed that punishment of sins can begin, even on one's deathbed. However, at the monk's death Gregory offered thirty masses in his remembrance to assist his soul before the final judgment. Eventually, Pope Pelagius II ordained Gregory a deacon and solicited his help in trying to heal the schism of the three chapters in northern Italy. However, this schism was not healed until well after Gregory was gone. Gregory had a deep respect for the monastic life. He viewed being a monk as the ardent quest for the vision of our Creator. His three paternal aunts were nuns renowned for their sanctity. However, after the two eldest died after seeing a vision of their ancestor Pope Felix III, the youngest soon abandoned the religious life and married the steward of her estate. Gregory's response to this family scandal was many are called but few are chosen. Gregory's mother Sylvia herself is a saint. In 579, Pelagius II chose Gregory as his Apocrisiarius, a post Gregory would hold until 586. Gregory was part of the Roman delegation that arrived in Constantinople in 578 to ask the emperor for military aid against the Lombards. With the Byzantine military focused on the east, these entreaties proved unsuccessful, in 584. Pelagius II wrote to Gregory as Apocrisiarius, detailing the hardships that Rome was experiencing under the Lombards and asking him to ask Emperor Maurice to send a relief force. Maurice, however, had long ago determined to limit his efforts against the Lombards to intrigue and diplomacy, pitting the Franks against them. It soon became obvious to Gregory that the Byzantine emperors were unlikely to send such a force, given their more immediate difficulties with the Persians in the east and the Avars and Slavs to the north. According to Economou, 
if Gregory's principal task was to plead Rome's cause before the emperor, there seems to have been little left for him to do once imperial policy toward Italy became evident. Papal representatives who pressed their claims with excessive vigor could quickly become a nuisance and find themselves excluded from the imperial presence altogether. Gregory had already drawn an imperial rebuke for his lengthy canonical writings on the subject of the legitimacy of John III Scholasticus, who had occupied the Patriarchate of Constantinople for twelve years prior to the return of Eudicius. Gregory turned himself to cultivating connections with the Byzantine elite of the city, where he became extremely popular with the city's upper class, especially aristocratic women. Economus surmises that while Gregory may have become spiritual father to a large and important segment of Constantinople's aristocracy, this relationship did not significantly advance the interests of Rome before the emperor. Although the writings of John the Deacon claim that Gregory labored diligently for the relief of Italy, there is no evidence that his tenure accomplished much towards any of the objectives of Pelagius II. Gregory's theological disputes with Patriarch Eudicius would leave a bitter taste for the theological speculation of the East with Gregory that continued to influence him well into his own papacy. According to Western sources, Gregory's very public debate with Eudicius culminated in an exchange before Tiberius II where Gregory cited a biblical passage in support of the view that Christ was corporeal and palpable after his resurrection. Allegedly as a result of this exchange, Tiberius II ordered Eudicius's writings burned. Economo views this argument, though exaggerated in Western sources, as Gregory's one achievement of an otherwise fruitless apocrisiariate. In reality, Gregory was forced to rely on scripture because he could not read the untranslated Greek authoritative works. Gregory left Constantinople for Rome in 585, returning to his monastery on the Saelian Hill. Gregory was elected by acclamation to succeed Pelagius II in 590, when the latter died of the plague spreading through the city. Gregory was approved by an imperial ISO from Constantinople the following September. In Constantinople, Gregory took issue with the aged Patriarch Eudicius of Constantinople, who had recently published a treatise, now lost, on the general resurrection. Eudicius maintained that the resurrected body will be more subtle than air, and no longer palpable. Gregory opposed with the palpability of the risen Christ in Luke 24:39. As the dispute could not be settled, the Byzantine Emperor, Tiberius II Constantine, undertook to arbitrate. He decided in favor of palpability and ordered Eudicius' book to be burned. Shortly after both Gregory and Eudicius became ill, Gregory recovered, but Eudicius died on April 5, 582, at age 70. On his deathbed Eudicius recanted impalpability and Gregory dropped the matter. Tiberius also died a few months after Eudicius. Apocrisiariate Controversy with Eudicius Although Gregory was resolved to retire into the monastic lifestyle of contemplation, he was unwillingly forced back into a world that, although he loved, he no longer wanted to be a part of. In texts of all genres, especially those produced in his first year as Pope, Gregory bemoaned the burden of office and mourned the loss of the undisturbed life of prayer he had once enjoyed as a monk. When he became Pope in 590, among his first acts was writing a series of letters disavowing any ambition to the throne of Peter and praising the contemplative life of the monks. At that time, for various reasons, the Holy See had not exerted effective leadership in the West since the pontificate of Gelasus I. 
the episcopacy in Gaul was drawn from the great territorial families, and identified with them, the parochial horizon of Gregory's contemporary, Gregory of Tours, may be considered typical, in Visigothic Spain the bishops had little contact with Rome, in Italy the territories which had de facto fallen under the administration of the papacy were beset by the violent Lombard dukes and the rivalry of the Byzantines in the Exarchate of Ravenna and in the south. Papacy Alms Works Liturgical Reforms Divine Liturgy of the Presanctified Gifts Pope Gregory had strong convictions on missions, Almighty God places good men in authority that he may impart through them the gifts of his mercy to their subjects. And this we find to be the case with the British over whom you have been appointed to rule, that through the blessings bestowed on you the blessings of heaven might be bestowed on your people also. He is credited with re-energizing the Church's missionary work among the non-Christian peoples of Northern Europe. He is most famous for sending a mission, often called the Gregorian Mission, under Augustine of Canterbury, prior of St. Andrews, where he had perhaps succeeded Gregory, to evangelize the pagan Anglo-Saxons of England. It seems that the Pope had never forgotten the English slaves whom he had once seen in the Roman Forum. The mission was successful, and it was from England that missionaries later set out for the Netherlands and Germany. The preaching of non-heretical Christian faith and the elimination of all deviations from it was a key element in Gregory's worldview, and it constituted one of the major continuing policies of his pontificate. According to the Gilbert Huddleston, he was declared a saint immediately after his death by popular acclamation. In his official documents, Gregory was the first to make extensive use of the term servant of the servants of God as a papal title, thus initiating a practice that was to be followed by most subsequent popes. Gregorian Chant Alms in Christianity is defined by passages of the New Testament such as Matthew 19.21, which commands, Go and sell that thou hast, and give to the poor, and come and follow me. A donation on the other hand is a gift to some sort of enterprise, profit, or non-profit. On the one hand the alms of Saint Gregory are to be distinguished from his donations, but on the other he himself probably saw no such distinction. The Church had no interest in secular profit and as Pope Gregory did his utmost to encourage that high standard among Church personnel. Apart from maintaining its facilities and supporting its personnel the Church gave most of the donations it received as alms. Gregory is known for his administrative system of charitable relief of the poor at Rome. They were predominantly refugees from the incursions of the Lombards. The philosophy under which he devised this system is that the wealth belonged to the poor and the church was only its steward. He received lavish donations from the wealthy families of Rome, who, following his own example, were eager, by doing so, to expiate their sins. He gave alms equally as lavishly both individually and en masse. He wrote in letters. The Church received donations of many different kinds of property, consumables such as food and clothing, investment property, real estate and works of art, and capital goods, or revenue-generating property, such as the Sicilian latifundia, or agricultural estates, staffed and operated by slaves, donated by Gregory and his family. The Church already had a system for circulating the consumables to the poor, associated with each parish was a diaconium or office of the deacon. He was given a building from which the poor could at any time apply for assistance. The state in which Gregory became Pope in 590 was a ruined one. The Lombards held the better part of Italy. 
their predations had brought the economy to a standstill. They camped nearly at the gates of Rome. The city was packed with refugees from all walks of life, who lived in the streets and had few of the necessities of life. The seat of government was far from Rome in Constantinople, which appeared unable to undertake the relief of Italy. The Pope had sent emissaries, including Gregory, asking for assistance, to no avail. In 590, Gregory could wait for Constantinople no longer. He organized the resources of the Church into an administration for general relief. In doing so he evidenced a talent for an intuitive understanding of the principles of accounting, which was not to be invented for centuries. The Church already had basic accounting documents, every expense was recorded in journals called Regista, lists of amounts, recipients, and circumstances. Revenue was recorded in polyptici, books. Many of these polyptici were ledgers recording the operating expenses of the Church and the assets, the patrimonia. A central papal administration, the notarii, under a chief, the primisarius notariorum, kept the ledgers and issued brevia patrimonii, or lists of property for which each rector was responsible. Gregory began by aggressively requiring his churchmen to seek out and relieve needy persons and reprimanded them if they did not. In a letter to a subordinate in Sicily he wrote, I asked you most of all to take care of the poor. And if you knew of people in poverty, you should have pointed them out. I desire that you give the woman, Pateria, forty solidi for the children's shoes and forty bushels of grain. Soon he was replacing administrators who would not cooperate with those who would and at the same time adding more in a build-up to a great plan that he had in mind. He understood that expenses must be matched by income. To pay for his increased expenses he liquidated the investment property and paid the expenses in cash according to a budget recorded in the polyptici. The churchmen were paid four times a year and also personally given a golden coin for their trouble. Writings Money, however, was no substitute for food in a city that was on the brink of famine. Even the wealthy were going hungry in their villas. The church now owned between 1,300 and 1,800 square miles of revenue-generating farmland divided into large sections called patrimonia. It produced goods of all kinds, which were sold, but Gregory intervened and had the goods shipped to Rome for distribution in the diaconia. He gave orders to step up production, set quotas, and put an administrative structure in place to carry it out. At the bottom was the rusticus who produced the goods. Some rustici were or owned slaves. He turned over part of his produce to a conductor from whom he leased the land. The latter reported to an actionarius, the latter to a defensor and the latter to a rector. Grain, wine, cheese, meat, fish, and oil began to arrive at Rome in large quantities, where it was given away for nothing as alms. Distributions to qualified persons were monthly. However, a certain proportion of the population lived in the streets or were too ill or infirm to pick up their monthly food supply. To them Gregory sent out a small army of charitable persons mainly monks, every morning with prepared food. It is said that he would not dine until the indigent were fed. When he did dine he shared the family table, which he had saved, with twelve indigent guests. To the needy living in wealthy homes he sent meals he had cooked with his own hands as gifts to spare them the indignity of receiving charity. Hearing of the death of an indigent in a back room he was depressed for days, entertaining for a time the conceit that he had failed in his duty and was a murderer. Identification of Three Figures in the Gospels 
These and other good deeds and charitable frame of mind completely won the hearts and minds of the Roman people. They now looked to the papacy for government, ignoring the rump state at Constantinople, which had only disrespect for Gregory, calling him a fool for his pacifist dealings with the Lombards. The office of urban prefect went without candidates. From the time of Gregory the Great to the rise of Italian nationalism the papacy was most influential presence in Italy. John the Deacon wrote that Pope Gregory I made a general revision of the liturgy of the pre-Tridentine Mass, removing many things, changing a few, adding some. In letters, Gregory remarks that he moved the Pater Noster to immediately after the Roman canon and immediately before the fraction. This position is still maintained today in the Roman liturgy. The pre-Gregorian position is evident in the Ambrosian Rite. Gregory added material to the Hankajitor of the Roman canon and established the nine Kyries at the beginning of Mass. He also reduced the role of deacons in the Roman liturgy. Iconography Famous quotes and anecdotes Memorials Sacramentaries directly influenced by Gregorian reforms are referred to as Sacramentaria Gregoriana. Roman and other Western liturgies since this era have a number of prayers that change to reflect the feast or liturgical season, these variations are visible in the collects and prefaces as well as in the Roman canon itself. In the Eastern Orthodox Church and Eastern Catholic Churches, Gregory is credited as the primary influence in constructing the more penitential divine liturgy of the pre-sanctified gifts, a fully separate form of the divine liturgy in the Byzantine rite adapted to the needs of the season of Great Lent. Its Roman rite equivalent is the Mass of the pre-sanctified used only on Good Friday. The Syriac liturgy of the pre-sanctified gifts continues to be used in the Malankara rite, a variant of the West Syrian rite historically practiced in the Malankara Church of India, and now practiced by the several churches that descended from it and at some occasions in the Assyrian Church of the East. The mainstream form of Western plain chant, standardized in the late 9th century, was attributed to Pope Gregory I and so took the name of Gregorian chant. The earliest such attribution is in John the Deacon's 873 biography of Gregory, almost three centuries after the Pope's death, and the chant that bears his name is the result of the fusion of Roman and Frankish elements which took place in the Franco-German Empire under Pepin, Charlemagne, and their successors. Gregory is commonly credited with founding the medieval papacy and so many attribute the beginning of medieval spirituality to him. Gregory is the only pope between the 5th and the 11th centuries whose correspondence and writings have survived enough to form a comprehensive corpus. Some of his writings are Gregory wrote over 850 letters in the last 13 years of his life that give us an accurate picture of his work. A truly autobiographical presentation is nearly impossible for Gregory. The development of his mind and personality remains purely speculative in nature. Opinions of the writings of Gregory vary. His character strikes us as an ambiguous and enigmatic one the Jewish-Canadian-American popularist Cantor observed. On the one hand he was an able and determined administrator, a skilled and clever diplomat, a leader of the greatest sophistication and vision, but on the other hand, he appears in his writings as a superstitious and credulous monk, hostile to learning, crudely limited as a theologian, and excessively devoted to saints, miracles, and relics. Gregory was among those who identified Mary Magdalene with Mary of Bethany, whom John 12,18 recounts as having anointed Jesus with precious ointment, an event that some interpret as being the same as the anointing of Jesus performed by a woman that Luke recounts as sinful. 
Preaching on the passage in the Gospel of Luke, Gregory remarked, This woman, whom Luke calls a sinner and John calls Mary, I think is the Mary from whom Mark reports that seven demons were cast out. Today biblical scholars distinguish the three figures, but they are all still popularly identified. In art Gregory is usually shown in full pontifical robes with the tiara and double cross, despite his actual habit of dress. Earlier depictions are more likely to show a monastic tonsure and plainer dress. Orthodox icons traditionally show St. Gregory vested as a bishop holding a gospel book and blessing with his right hand. It is recorded that he permitted his depiction with a square halo, then used for the living. A dove is his attribute from the well-known story attributed to his friend Peter the Deacon, who tells that when the Pope was dictating his homilies on Ezekiel a curtain was drawn between his secretary and himself. As, however, the Pope remained silent for long periods at a time, the servant made a hole in the curtain and, looking through, beheld a dove seated upon Gregory's head with its beak between his lips. When the dove withdrew its beak the Pope spoke and the secretary took down his words, but when he became silent the servant again applied his eye to the hole and saw the dove had replaced its beak between his lips. Ribera's oil painting of St. Gregory the Great is from the Giustiniani collection. The painting is conserved in the Galleria Nazionale d'Arte Antica, Rome. The face of Gregory is a caricature of the features described by John the Deacon, total baldness, outthrust chin, beak-like nose, whereas John had described partial baldness, a mildly protruding chin, slightly aquiline nose and strikingly good looks. In this picture also Gregory has his monastic back on the world, which the real Gregory, despite his reclusive intent, was seldom allowed to have. This scene is shown as a version of the traditional evangelist portrait from the 10th century onwards. An early example is the dedication miniature from an 11th century manuscript of St. Gregory's Moralia in Job. The miniature shows the scribe, Bebo of Sian Abbey, presenting the manuscript to the Holy Roman Emperor, Henry II. In the upper left the author is seen writing the text under divine inspiration. Usually the dove is shown whispering in Gregory's ear for a clearer composition. The late medieval subject of the Mass of St. Gregory shows a version of a 7th century story that was elaborated in later hagiography. Gregory is shown saying Mass when Christ as the Man of Sorrows appears on the altar. The subject was most common in the 15th and 16th centuries, and reflected growing emphasis on the real presence, and after the Protestant Reformation was an assertion of the doctrine against Protestant theology. The relics of St. Gregory are enshrined in St. Peter's Basilica in Rome. In Britain, appreciation for Gregory remained strong even after his death with him being called Gregorius Noster by the British. It was in Britain, at a monastery in Whitby, that the first full-length life of Gregory was written, in c. 713. Appreciation of Gregory in Rome and Italy itself, however, did not come until later. The first Vita of Gregory written in Italy was not produced until John the Deacon in the 9th century. The namesake Church of San Gregorio al Celio remembers his work. One of the three oratories annexed, the Oratory of St. Sylvia, is said to lie over the tomb of Gregory's mother. In England, Gregory, along with Augustine of Canterbury, is revered as the Apostle of the Land and the source of the nation's conversion. Italian composer Otto Rino Respighi composed a piece named St. Gregory the Great that features as the fourth and final part of his church windows works, 
written in 1925. The current general Roman calendar, revised in 1969 as instructed by the Second Vatican Council, celebrates St. Gregory the Great on September 3. Before that, it assigned his feast day to March 12, the day of his death in 604. This day always falls within Lent, during which there are no obligatory memorials. For this reason his feast day was moved to September 3, the day of his episcopal consecration in 590. The Eastern Orthodox Church and those Eastern Catholic Churches which follow the Byzantine Rite continue to commemorate St. Gregory on March 12 which is during Great Lent, the only time when the Divine Liturgy of the Presanctified Gifts, which names St. Gregory as its author, is used. Other churches also honor St. Gregory, the Church of England and the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod on September 3rd, the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America and the Episcopal Church in the United States and the Anglican Church of Canada on March 12th. A traditional procession is held in Zegtun, Malta, in honor of St. Gregory on Easter Wednesday, which most often falls in April, the range of possible dates being March 25th to April 28th. The feast day of St. Gregory also serves as a commemorative day for the former pupils of Downside School, called Old Gregorians. Traditionally, og ties are worn by all of the society's members on this day. Relics Lives Monuments Music Feast day Bibliography Modern editions Translations Secondary literature <laughs>